Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome once again to the Rec Poker Podcast. I am your host, Steve Fredland, and this is episode 106, and I'm uh, just delighted that you're still sticking with me. We continue to grow, and uh, some cool things have been happening uh, with the podcast, with the training, and so thanks for being a part of that deal. Uh, this week is a little bit different in some regards. Uh, the podcast is basically the same, but I am going to try to record this for video. So either it doesn't work or if it works, it'll be the first time that uh, this podcast will be on video. Uh, the excitement for me there is that it reaches a, a new audience of, of YouTube people, but also uh, it allows me to then put in some of the uh, some of the uh, things that I'm pointing out on the podcast, some of the presentation material, some of the outlines, some of those things. So you actually can have a visual representation of what I'm talking about Uh, when I'm talking about opening hand ranges or hand scenarios or bullet points or whatever it might be. So uh, if you're listening to this on the podcast, uh, just know uh, either this episode or hopefully soon, uh, you'll also be able to see this on YouTube. And of course, we'll link to all of those things through the Facebook group, through Twitter, uh, through the Rec Paint Poker Training website, all of those things. So stay tuned uh, on that deal. Uh, The goal, as always, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build the quality and the number of people uh, recreational players uh, playing Texas Hold'em. And uh, one of the interesting things that's happened over that is, you know, that's been the vision for a while. But um, one of the things I'm trying to do is figure out, okay, well, strategically, what does that look like? There's a lot of different ways that we can go with that. Um, and as this has grown, it's, it's in a sense forced me to look at, well, what do we mean by that? And how are we going to accomplish that? And I've landed on two really key strategies, uh, two areas that I'm really going to focus on. One is trying to curate content to try to bring you the the greatest insights, uh, the greatest impact for the limited amount of time and money that you've budgeted for poker training. So uh, I know some of you out there have uh, much more time and much more resources for this, but most of the folks that are listening are uh, people that are working full time, playing this as a hobby. They don't have time to pour through the hours and hours of material, even if it's free. And so one of the things I'm hoping to do is to do some of that legwork for you, uh, find the most interesting, the most applicable things, and bring that to you uh, free of charge on the podcast, and then make some of it available for cost uh, at some of the webinars and that sort of thing. But generally, trying to curate that content for you so you don't have to spend all that time, yet you can still have great impact uh, in improving your game. And the second thing is really uh, dis- making the decision to try to help people build our poker communities, uh, in a sense, our poker tribe, you know, part of this rec poker nation. But, but you know, we're, we're kind of big that way, rec poker nation. The idea here is how can we help people in their area geographically, in their communities, uh, start to build relationships with other players who are also trying to learn the game and even just other relationships at large. So uh, those are really the two key strategic wings of what I'm trying to do to build this game. Uh, one is trying to uh, curate content and bring you the most effective things most bang for your buck. And secondly, is trying to help build these poker communities. Uh, the feedback I get from a lot of people is I just don't know anybody else that really wants to learn poker. I'm playing with people that just like to play, but they don't want to learn. So hopefully through this, we can actually help um, move you to a place where you have relationships with people that want to learn the game, uh, like myself, uh, who, who is super passionate about the game. All right, a couple of things that I'm going to share more at the end to keep the details down there, but a uh, reminder that we are going to have our first online player panel Q&A on November 29th from 7 to 9 p.m. Central Time. Uh, Matt Hamilton, Max Havlish, Ian Matakis, and Alan Cardi will be online. Uh, we, we had a successful test of the, uh, of the communication, so that's good. And you can actually go out to the website now, uh, and you can register for that. We're going to charge $10 for you to be part of that uh of that uh, panel, panel, you can uh, ask questions during it as well, and they'll get to as many as they can. So if you go to recpokertraining.com, you go to the learning com- learning options, I think it's called, and in there, there is a uh, online uh, recreational player panel, and you can register right there. That'll get you all the way through, uh, so you'll have the invite to join us on November 29th for our first ever webinar, which we're super excited about. Uh, Also, I'm toying with the idea of the weekend of December 15th and 16th locally here in East Central Minnesota doing a a play and learn. Uh, You can read about that on the website, but basically uh, people play and then who's ever there, uh, both playing and observing, we flip over all the cards and we talk about the decision process. And it's one of the ways that I would 
uh, say has has most impacted my game as far as uh, learning um, per unit of time, I guess. Uh, Fantastic discussions always happen in those situations. So if that's something you're interested in, please reach out to me. Please let me know. I'm in the process right now of evaluating if that's something that we uh, can still pull off in time. If there's enough interest, uh, certainly there is some. And then finally, uh, I'm looking at doing a a Flopzilla webinar. I know all of these people that we talk to, they say, you got to know Flopzilla. Well, some of us aren't familiar with that tool. So I'm looking to do an online webinar, uh, make it pretty cheap for people, but then have somebody uh, lead us through uh, using Flopzilla. Uh, How do you use it? But even more importantly, um, who cares? You know, is it just interesting numbers or is there some things that we can actually use it to make some, uh, some insights for? So I'm looking at doing that as well. So if that's you or if you have somebody you know, that would be a great resource and willing to do that uh, fairly cheap so we can keep the cost down, uh, please let me know. Okay, so getting into today's content, uh, and for those of you who are on the video, I'm still trying to figure out where to look. Uh, It's natural for me to look at myself when I'm on the screen, but that looks like this when you're on the video. If I'm reading uh, some of my notes, it looks like this, and if I'm really diligent, I look at the camera, so it looks like I'm looking at you. Bear with me. I've got a face for radio, so uh, (laughs) bear with me, but I think this will be be helpful for our learning as we go forward. But anyway, um, one of the one of the things that I came across and had a few people recommend to me was this uh, great free video from Alex Fitzgerald, uh, assass- Assassinato or Assassinato. I guess he goes by. He's one of the great uh, poker coaches that's out there, and he partnered with Jonathan Little at PokerCoaching.com um, to put together this video. Uh, it's called "The Five Ways to Destroy Your Tournament Results," and just a fantastic forty-minute video. It's part of him really plugging this master tournaments in one class uh, uh, course that he is offering. And by the way, I'm trying to get my hands on that so, and be able to share that with you guys. So stay tuned. I think it's going to be great stuff. Um, but anyway, I wanted to share this week uh, what I learned from this five ways to destroy your tournament results. Uh, I thought it was really fascinating. He's got a lot of um, uh, numeric and combinatorics and statistical background on all of this. Uh, but I just wanted to share the key takeaways for you, again, as part of this curating and kind of boiling it down. Uh, the five things that he said were really the the things that are destroying your tournament results that you should you could just quick fix right now. Number one is calling down with weak top pairs and second pairs for no reason. So he said we're, people do that too much. They just um, they just keep calling down. They just never believe their opponent. Um, he, he looked at an example of, say you call out a position with second pair um, against someone who raises preflop, they continuation bet, and then they turn bet. Okay, so let's say we're out of position. We have something like a ace-10 and the flop comes king-10-7, something like that. So uh, somebody raised preflop, and we, we call out of the blinds with ace-10, and we hit the 10. Okay, so now this person continuation bets. So we check, they see bet, and we call. Then we check, and they bet again on the turn. Now, he would say in this spot, based on all the the research that he's done, that in that spot, people are only betting about 40% of the time. So they're checking back about 60% of the time once you've called them twice. So if they are betting... Uh, they are ahead of you. If they are in that 40%, they're ahead of you. And his recommendation is just just fold the turn. Just give up in that case. Um, They're almost always betting for value. And if they're betting for value, our second pair doesn't beat any of those value hands. Uh, They could have us just crushed. And then the other piece that he mentions is we're out of position and the hand doesn't end on the turn. So if we call the turn, there's a great chance that we're going to face a river bet. And because we called on the pre-flop, flop, and turn, we're probably going to pay that off as well. Even though in that situation, people are only betting the river about 28% of the time. And if they're only betting 28% of the time, they're almost always going to have us crushed. And that river bet is going to be a big, a big bet. And we're going to pay that off and we're going to lose a lot of money generally doing that. Uh, he said, you know, even if they're, let's say on the turn, they're just they're still betting a draw. Let's say they have an open-ended straight draw or a flush draw, and they don't get there on the river. Well, this is only, as he looked at the numbers, this is only going to be 30% of their range. They're going to have it 70% of the time. So they're, they're bluffing on the river 30%, and they're betting 70% of the time if they have the draws. If they don't even have draws, then you're really crushed. But even in that spot, uh, if they're going to make a reasonable river bet, um, they're going to get they're going to get paid off, um, and they're only going to be betting their bluffs thirty percent of the time. 
interestingly, he looked at the data and it showed that um, in this situation where somebody bets all of those streets, the average person who called the turn is also calling the river 80% of the time. So in that spot, they almost always have it. And the person out of position almost always calls. So it's a huge recipe. It's a huge expected value positive play for the person in position. And it's a huge negative expected value play for the person that's out of position. Uh, and he said, um, he said uh, this is actually one of these spots where you're really just seeking a high. You're looking to make that hero call. And this is, of course, something that, that I do on, on often on occasion, hopefully not too much in this spot, but I do. Uh, but he said, this is really about seeking a high, about uh, calling somebody down, about being right, about not letting them push you around the table, more so than actually being supported by analytics. So he would argue it's a negative expected value play, but we do it because we're seeking that high of being right. Um, so that was the first one is calling down with weak top pairs and second pairs for no reason. He said, there's times to do it, but you have to have a pretty good reason to do it. The second thing that can destroy your tournament results is betting the turn and betting the river as a bluff. So, um, what he said here, he looked at one example. He says, if I get three bet, or he says, if I three bet and I get called pre-flop and if I get called on a flop, he said, we should stop betting the turn. Okay, we need to stop betting the turn and stop betting the river as bluffs. So if I get if I three bet and I get called preflop and get called on the flop, I should stop betting the turn. In these spots, they call turn bets 72% of the time and they call river 80% of the time. Okay, so if I'm if I'm betting preflop and I bet the flop, now if I'm gonna bet the turn, they're gonna call me three out of four times. And then if I call and if I bet the river, they're gonna call me four out of five times. So if we're bluffing and they're only folding one out of four times or one out of five times, we can't bet enough to push these people off, okay? The one thing, the one thing he did say is, however, if you're playing against profitable regulars, they will fold more often than this 72 or 80% of the time. So actually, bluffing turn and river works better against those players. But in general, we're playing against you know, average to below average players. Uh, if they're going to call preflop, if they're going to call flop, they're not going to fold turn or river in general. Okay, uh, he says weaker players are calling down too much with weak top pairs and second pairs. So this is where number one and number two work together. We need to be the people that are uh, that are not calling down with those weak top pairs and second pairs, and we need to be people that are be the people that are not betting the turn and river against people that aren't going to fold. Okay, uh, he said this one also betting the turn and betting the river as a bluff is another sort of a, a seeking of a high, uh, and it is also not supported by analytics. Okay, the third one is moving all in to combat an unlikely three-bet bluff. So here he says that the average player, in probably applies to the games that we're playing, the average player three-bets only 6.6%. So when we get three-bet by an average player, especially out of position and especially against our early position raise, we are usually in rough shape even if they have a polarized three-betting range. So when we're in that spot, uh, if we get three bet, it's almost always not going to be a bluff. And so we need to stop shoving to try to combat that. Uh, in general, he's, he's an example. Say we raise under the gun with pocket nines. Somebody in the blinds re-raises us, and he asks the question, well, what should we do? And for a lot of people, they would say, well, let's just shove right here. And um, because if they're bluffing, then we'll win the pot right there. Um, he would say, in general... Um, they're not going to be bluffing, and we're probably going to lose a lot of chips. And one of the insights he made was, you know, in general, he, he said about this situation with pocket nines, he says, you know, it's just, a bad, it's just a bad position, and there is no good option. It seems like we shouldn't fold. It seems like we shouldn't raise. And it almost seems like we shouldn't call. So uh, what do we do there? He said that all the options are bad. He said when you're in a situation where all of the options are bad, choose the one that has the lowest volatility. Do we want to risk our tournament life four bet shoving pocket nines. And he talked a little bit about Warren Buffett as well, how he does not invest in things that we don't know about. And we should be the same way. We don't really know what this person's doing. We don't know if they're bluffing. We don't know if they have it, but we shouldn't really invest in something we really don't know about. So I, I but I like that idea of, you know, if, if every option's a bad option, go the low volatility route, especially in tournament poker. 
Okay, the fourth one that he uh, that he touched on was um, we can uh, kind of kill ourselves, or what was the name of the title? He says we can uh, destroy our tournament results uh, by pot controlling when a value bet is more profitable. Okay, sometimes we don't uh, we don't value bet. We don't get the value from our hands. Uh, he says if you raise pre flop in position, and then you check the flop. How often does your opponent bet the turn? Uh, it's very difficult to know as it's, as it's sort of just wide across the board. Every player is different. But one of the things that he said is that, you know, check raising in this spot is very, very rare, uh, maybe about 10% of the time, uh, because that's one of the reasons why we do that, why we raise preflop and then we check the flop is that we're afraid to get check raised. And he would say being check raised is very rare. Um, and when they do it, they almost always have it. Um, uh, he said that when, when he's coaching people, he's trying to get them to check raise more. And he says it's one of the most difficult things that he can get people to do is people just don't want to check raise. They just won't do it. And so as we're playing, we should have that in the back of our mind that check raising is something people just don't generally do. Um, however, the pre-flop flatting range from the big blind only has top pair better 16% of the time. So in other words, if, if we raise and somebody um, somebody in the big blind defends, um, they're only going to have top pair or better 16% of the time. So what are they check raising with? So the question is, um, you know, if they're check raising, they have a big hand almost always. So they're rarely, they're rarely doing it, and they rarely have a hand. So that means that they're, when they are doing it, uh, they, they probably have a monster. So if, if we have a made hand, uh, he would say it's very profitable to bet to get value. And then if they check raise, we probably have to fold, but we're leaving a lot of value on the table by not getting value from those inferior hands. So the, the, the question he basically asks um, when he's deciding if he should continuation bet for value is, is my hand better than the average pair? And if so, then C bet. So whatever hand we have, if we think it's better than what the average pair would be, whether it's they hit middle pair, bad kicker, bottom pair, pocket pair that's you know that's lower, um, if we think we're better than the average pair, we should see bet. Uh, it's going to fold out a lot of stuff, uh, and it's also going to get us a value from those worse hands. And if we get check raised, uh, we're probably crushed, and we can just fold. Okay, so the final one is not value betting rivers enough or uh, not doing it with proper sizings. So again, coming back to value betting, how do we get value from our made hands? Um, One of the examples he used is when we've been betting every street and then we get there on the river and we need to make sure that we bet for value. Uh, the example he used uh, was, was one that we see sometimes in our tournaments where uh, somebody's betting, draws, and they finally get there and they have the absolute nuts and they just shove all in and they lose a ton of value because people fold. Um, but in general, we need to make sure that we're getting value from the river. And so to do that, what we need to do is we need to think about what, what, does, what does our opponent have uh, to, to call us all of the way? They've called us twice uh, on, the, on the flop and on the turn. Uh, so we have to think about what do they have and then think about what, what the river looks like for their hand range. Um, is it a, is a scary card? You know, if we get there, it's a very good chance it's a scare card for them. You know what I mean? Like if we've been betting a draw and all of a sudden our draw gets there, it's going to be a scare card for them. So if it's a scare card for them, how much money are they going to be willing to put in? I guess that's kind of the, the ultimate uh, question. And um, he also went on, so, so we need to get value, but he went on and he said, the check raises on the river are extremely rare. He says about 3% of the time people will check raise the river. Uh, And so we don't have to worry a lot about being check raised on the river, even though I know we do and it does happen and that sort of thing. Um, But the risk of that is very rare compared to the risk of not getting value from our top pair. Um, And he said we want to give our our opponents the opportunity to hero call us. If it just goes check, check, they don't have the opportunity to call us down with ace high when we beat them or to call down with second pair or to call down with third pair. We need to make them our customer. Um, We need to give them, uh, you know, a, a choice that looks appealing to them. Uh, I know I've, I've been in this spot many times as the person with the decision to hero call. Somebody makes, you know, a third, a third pot size bet on the river. 
I have a decision. Um, I can fold and just kind of give up all that, all the pot, or I can call. And when I call, um, one of two things usually happens. They flip over a really big hand, and I just fold and can pretend like, oh, I had a good hand too. Or they show over a bad hand, and I call, uh, and, and I actually win with my hero call, and I look like the absolute goat, right? Um, so I can either fold and not have to show my hand what I was calling so light with, or I win and look like a hero. That's a great, uh, a great place to be in for me. And so what we want to do is we want to put our opponents in that same situation. When we have a hand that we think we're ahead on, we're not really worried about being check raised. We put out that bet and we want to give our opponent that option. We want them to call. We want them to call. We want to show our hand and have them throw theirs away in disgust, but not have to be embarrassed because they didn't show what they called with. We want to give them that option because we want that value. And oftentimes that bet on the river is somewhere in that neighborhood of 10 to 15 big blinds. Well, that's a pretty big pot when you think about it. Um, that's just a pretty big bet size. Uh, how often do you steal blinds and nannies and you pick up one or two? I mean, here's a chance to pick up 10 or 15 blinds of value. Uh, when you think about a cash game, uh, I don't play cash, but you know, my understanding is that you know, 10, 15, 20 big blinds an hour is a really good win rate. Well, here's an opportunity with one bet to make that up right there. So I think we don't want to lose a lot of value there. We want to give our opponents the opportunity to hero call, which means we don't want to just make huge bets and scare people off when we have a big hand. We want them to call uh, with worse hands. So that's a summary of what Alex shared. And I, I would strongly encourage you to go out there and check out all of his stuff, Assassinato Poker Coaching. Um, He's getting stuff through PokerCoaching.com with his relationship with Jonathan Little. So go check out that stuff. I'm going to keep trying to secure some of that real premium content. I think he's going to sell this this, uh, content for this next thing for about $400. So I'm going to try to secure that and then be able to share parts or all of it uh, with you guys through different things that are a lot cheaper and hopefully uh, uh, less time commitment. So that's what I have for today. I'm going to do a few announcements and promotions, but uh, that's the end of the content if you want to check off there. Uh, The announcements, remember, online, November 29th, 7 to 9 p.m., it's available now. This is going to be our, our recreational player panel uh, with Matt and Max and Ian and Alan. Uh, it's going to be great. Uh, we tested out the functionality. Really, uh, really handy to use. You can ask questions really easily online. Uh, really good uh, audio and video quality. So I think you're going to enjoy that. You can go out there now and secure your spot. Um, the spacing is limited. I'm not sure exactly how many we can take, but uh, I would recommend if you're going to do it, go out there and reserve it. Ten bucks. Um, there are some discounts available to some of you. Uh, you know who you are, uh, but you can go out there and you can get that for ten bucks. Um, and I'm also going to put the link in the, the newsletter this weekend. Which reminds me, if you're not uh, on our email newsletter, get on there. I'll try not to clutter it up too much. Probably you know once a week, once every two weeks, we'll send a newsletter out with links and that sort of thing, just to keep you aware of the training opportunities that are available, uh, both locally here in East Central Minnesota, but as well as uh, nationally or internationally as well. Which hey, thanks to those of you who give me a shout out. For different countries that's super fun to hear that you're uh, you're listening and, and tuned in also uh, as i mentioned at the beginning uh, i do want to look at doing some some play and learn type of sessions i've done this with some friends it's fantastic where you all play the hand out as you normally would and then everybody shows their hands and you talk about why people made the decision that they made fantastic discussions come out of that uh, I'm looking at doing that here locally the weekend of December 15th and 16th. So if that's something you're interested in, please let me know. Uh, but I've also mentioned this to other people that have inquired through email, Facebook, Twitter. Uh, I'm willing to travel to do any of this stuff. So whether it's do one of these uh, play and learn sessions to facilitate that, or it's to do a seminar like the anatomy of an MTT or any of this other stuff that you're doing, I'm willing to travel to do it. Obviously, I've got to have the expenses covered and that sort of thing. But uh, if that's something you're interested in, get your home group together, get a group together, do it at a casino, whatever it is. Uh, I'm willing to travel and make that happen. And I'd love to get out and about and kind of meet more of Rec Poker Nation uh, anyway. So let me know if that's something you're, you're interested in doing. Uh, also, uh, an announcement for, for Patreon.com. Uh, with some of this new infrastructure, I'm super excited. Uh, Brad Olson has done a great job of helping me set this stuff up. Uh, we now have more of a storefront website, so if you want to buy any of these seminars, coaching, analytics, reports, any of that sort of stuff, you can just do that through RecPokerTraining.com. Uh, buy it as as uh, most people do in the 21st century. Um, 
but you can get all that stuff out there. So Patreon, uh, I'm, I'm still have that open, and I, but I'm reverting that to really be more what its original intent was, which was to support and encourage creative content. And so where that's at is for those of you who are out there listening, if you love getting this for free, uh, you're not really plugging into the other stuff. If you want to give your support, give your encouragement, um, I would love nothing more than for you to support me out on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, if you do $5 a month, you'll still get the regular monthly reports that show some of the analytics um, of the consolidated group that submitted data. But um, any support is great. And ultimately, that's just a, a huge encouragement to me to know that uh, those of you who are out there uh, appreciate this enough that you're willing to give you know, a buck or two a month uh, to say thanks. So uh, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, final, final reminders. Uh, again, thank you to Running Aces for, uh, for sponsoring the podcast. Thanks to the listeners, the contributors, all my friends out there in poker nation Uh, it's fun to meet a lot of you at least virtually Uh, one of the greatest things you can do also is get out on itunes uh, like like the episode uh, subscribe to rec poker podcast uh, leave a comment rate it review it tell other people about it Uh, that's really the best thing you can do if you're like hey i want to say thanks to steve for putting this on do that stuff Uh, help me help me promote it uh, to your to your friends uh, also, if you want patches, if you want to get some hats, shirts, or sweatshirts, you can go to flopTheWorld.com slash RecPoker. The patches, just reach out to me and I'll mail you some. That's no problem at all. Uh, and also, if you have any feedback, feel free to email me, Steve, Steve at RecPokerTraining.com or through Facebook, Twitter, or whatever. So that is it for today. I want to thank you guys for joining me on this, uh, on this journey. And we'll see what comes up next. A lot of cool things happening, and I'm excited to see myself. So with that, uh, have yourself a great day on and off the felt. Take care of yourself. Adios. Adios.